Eric is a neuroscientist and a neurosurgeon in particular, uh, but he's also an entrepreneur. He's actually a novelist as well. And um, he has some interesting perspectives about the intersection of the brain and information that we can gather from the brain and information, uh, what we can do with that information for both people who are inside of what we would traditionally think of as healthcare and the needs of healthcare, but also people outside of that. So uh, with that, Eric, uh, we look forward to your talk. Well, uh, first off, let me uh, thank uh, Astro for inviting me and also thank Google for inviting me out. It's a real pleasure to be here. So the title of my talk is The Emerging World of ECOG Neuroprosthetics. And what I'd like to talk about first is I'm going to define what a neuroprosthetic or a brain-computer interface is, what signals do we use for brain-computer interfaces, uh, why ECOG, and that's kind of the signal that I've been studying a lot uh, for its application, and what are some of the near-term applications and what are the future implications of this. So first off, what is a neuroprosthetic? Well, a neuroprosthetic often, it's, and it has multiple names, uh, brain-computer interface, some other names are brain-machine interface, neurorobotics. Um, basically, it's a device that can monitor and decode electrical signals from a, an individual's brain and convert that information to some type of machine control. So essentially, uh, again, just you're taking some type of signal here from the brain. We're going to talk about that in just a moment, digitizing it, processing it, and then analyzing it such that you can interpret the intentions of this brain and convert it to some type of device control, whether it be something simple, like controlling a cursor on a screen, uh, to something more uh, intermediate in, in complexity, such as uh, controlling a wheelchair or some other type of machine, to even controlling your own limbs or some robotic limbs. And the idea is, and the reason you know, I come at this from a neurosurgical standpoint, is that for people with spinal cord injury, stroke, neuromuscular disorders, who have severe motor impairment, by accessing the brain directly, we can potentially uh, create a shortcut around that disability and give them an, uh, an ability to in interact uh, with their environment in a better way and, and in a non-biologic way. So uh, kind of before I start uh, kind of talking about kind of some of the ways that we do bring computer interfaces, I also want to talk about there's different types in broad categories of different types of uh, brain-computer interfaces. Uh, there's an input BCI where basically you're taking something from the outside world and putting it in as a perception. That's called an input BCI. Now alternatively, and kind of what I'm going to focus my talk on, is you have an intention, basically your brain wants to do something, and you convert that to an overt real-world action, such as moving a cursor on a screen. Okay. Now, the, when, is, when we talk about intentions, we're, we have several different brain signals that we can utilize to infer those intentions. And again, just here's a little brief anatomy lesson. So again, here's kind of a side view of the brain, frontal lobe, temporal lobe, occipital lobe, parietal lobe. And the majority of neurons are actually on the surface of the brain. Um, that's called cortex. And over, over top of the cortex, we have kind of a leathery membrane, and that's called the dura. The long term is called dura mater, which is Latin for a tough mother. Um, and I don't know why they called it that, but anyway. Um, and so then outside of that is the skull, and then outside of that is the scalp. Now, again, there's, we can put our electrodes in different spots to get signals from the brain, and they each have different characteristics. Uh, first off, and kind of ones that you may be familiar with, we can put electrodes on the scalp, and that's EEG or electroencephalography, uh, relatively non-invasive and easy to use. We can put electrodes in the brain, and these are called single unit systems, and these are hair-like electrodes that monitor single neurons firing. And again, these tend to be more invasive. Or we can go somewhere in between, and we can put electrodes on the surface of the brain, and that's called electrocorticography, or ECOG for short. And again, that's intermediate in its uh, invasiveness. So first off, let's start off with the single neuron and talk about that and work our way up. So in terms of single unit systems, kind of the way these work is, again, we're putting single, small hair-like electrodes into the brain surface. And uh, we're having these small electrodes. Uh, again, this is an example of what's called a Michigan probe, which is monitoring the action potential firing rate of a neuron. And basically what that is, uh, neurons will change their voltage in kind of in a span of around five milliseconds. And that's called an action potential. Basically, you know, it, it activates and, di and discharges an electrical signal down the axon. And uh, 
Now, the rate and the timing of these action potentials actually give information. And that's uh, what you know, I kind of almost get it from a neurosurgical standpoint. I just call it the Morse code of brain activity. Basically, the, the dot, 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 dot of activity can give us information about what that the uh, information that neuron is trying to convey. And so some of the earliest examples of this um, were presented by this guy named Georgiopoulos in 1982. And what he did is he did what's called a center out task. And what that is is here's this little kind of articulated arm. It's called a manipulandum. And basically what he did is he had a monkey manipulate that manipulandum from the center of a, uh, a table to a peripheral target. Kind of see around here. And here's kind of the tracing that the monkey made. And you can actually see the little monkey arm right there. And concurrently, he recorded neuronal activity while the monkey was moving his arm. And let me show you an example of that. And so what he found was that depending on the direction that the monkey moved his arm affected the action potential firing rate. So that if he moved it up and to the left in this example, there's a larger action potential firing rate than if he moved it in a different direction, that there was a lower action potential firing rate. And you're seeing that graphically here. And so each of these lines, again, that's technically called a raster plot, is, again, remember that little dot, 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 and so each of these dots represents an action potential fire. And again, each of these lines represents a different time that the monkey moved his arm. And so when you, what you see here is when he moved up and to the left, we see that there's a high degree of firing up and to the left here, but when he moved down to the right, much lower. And when you actually regret, yep, yeah, there's a question in the back? Yeah, I can't see the uh, graph clearly enough to figure out what the low rate and the high rates are. Can you just tell us what the numbers are? Oh, um, roughly uh, anywhere between uh, 20 to 60. Uh, 20 per, per, second. per second, that's right, yep. Yeah. Um, so... I'm sorry? Oh, sorry, I thought somebody else had a question. So in any case, so when you try to regress that activity to a line, it regresses to a cosine-tuned curve. And they, the, the term has been coined since that time, cosine, cosine tuning, so that a neuron essentially has a preferred direction that it likes to fire. And so if you, put, if you record from a number of different neurons, you can actually predict where that monkey wants to move his arm in three-dimensional space. And so I'll show you a graphic representation of that. So this is actually data taken from a real monkey. And uh, around, I think, 60, it's been recorded from around 60 neurons. The length of the uh, yellow line represents the firing rate, how fast is the neuron firing. And the um, uh, direction is the preferred direction of that neuron. And so essentially, it's a kind of a summed vector. And what you'll see here is that, um, and this is kind of the actual movement of the monkey arm, again, all in a stylized fashion here. But basically, it's, it's a vector sum of that direction of those multiple neurons that actually precedes the actual movement of the um, arm movement. And really, this is one of the er first demonstrations that we can take brain activity and decode it so that we could know the user, in this case, the monkey's intentions before they actually did it by around 60 milliseconds. Okay? And now, now since we know the intention from the brain, it doesn't mean that we actually have to control an arm. We, we can actually control. I think we're getting some noise here. Please mute your microphones if you're on the VC bridge. Thanks. We good? OK, great. So, um, whoop. so in any case, um, it doesn't mean that we actually have to control a real arm. We can control a robotic arm. Right? As long as we know those intentions, we can take that and we can control something else. And so let me show you an example. This is, this is work done by uh, Andy Schwartz out of the University of Pittsburgh. And again, there's a, uh, an implanted array in the monkey's head here. And for privacy reasons, we've covered his eyes. For healthcare privacy these days, that we have to protect his identity so that his monkey buddies don't know that it's him participating. But um, in any case, so here you can see that he's controlling this robotic arm from around uh, 60 neurons. Um, and so that he's able to feed himself. Again, it doesn't take a lot of imagination to think that if we can decode this information that, uh, and we can control some type of external robotic for people with severe motor disabilities, this could potentially augment uh, their capabilities. Okay. Now, there are, however, problems. I'm not saying they're never going to be pr solved, but currently one of the problems uh, with uh, microelectrode arrays is that after a period of time, scar forms around these electrodes. Uh, and it's due to a number of different reasons that have been proposed. Micromotion of the implant, 
the brain actually moves a fair bit in our heads. Uh, basically, you know, as we walk down steps or really anything that we do, our brain moves by several millimeters. It's kind of just look, if you ever see it, you know, it basically is kind of like cold, uh, almost like cold jello. So it kind of, it kind of it jiggles a bit. Um, uh, there's a foreign body response that the neuronal processes tend to retract from the shank of the electrode as well as uh, penetration of the microvascular leads to um, inflammation and the formation of a gliotic sheath or a scar around the electrode. So oftentimes we're losing signal after around six months. So from a neurosurgical standpoint, I'm not going to want to be putting a new one in every six months surgically. And that's been a problem with these because you get very good control, but the durability of these constructs right now is a problem. So then kind of, kind of broadening out, now if we look at these uh, signals in populations, uh, we can also get different types of information, and they have different features to them for, from a brain-computer interface standpoint. So now we're going to talk about ECOG and EEG, basically, again, uh, larger populations of neurons acting in synchrony. And uh, again, we're either get, putting our electrode on the scalp, we're putting it on the skull, and we see, again, what are classically known as kind of brain waves, you know, kind of oscillations of signals. And we look at how those oscillations change relative to various cognitive activities. And so when you actually see kind of the uh, 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 signal traits, whether it be from EEG or from ECOG, it looks relatively chaotic. And I guess the best example that I would give you here is that I'd like you to listen to this. Can you hear that? I don't know if that... Do you know what's playing right now? Do you know that? Well, actually, it's uh, several different things playing all at the same time. You know, but together it sounds like noise. And so we actually have, I guess I'll talk into the mic here, uh, Beethoven's Symphony Number no. 1 and C. Again, a more subtle sound, kind of hard to hear. Mozart's uh, uh, Symphony Number no. 25 in G. A little bit bolder. And then something a little bit more modern with Thievery Corporation, Holographic Universe. Again, different rhythm uh, and different sound. And each of these, and each of these uh, uh, rhythms has an intrinsic uh, kind of value to it. It conveys information and has an intrinsic order. But when compiled together, it sounds like junk and noise. And so we have to be able to separate those different rhythms uh, to get the most information out of that. And the way that we do it is that, when we, again, once again, looking at these, this initial junky rhythm here, is that it's really the super, kind of superposition of a number of different frequencies. And each of those frequencies really represents different neural sources um, that give us different information about the cognitive intentions. And so broadly, some of those sources are these lower frequencies. And again, they have a number of different names, theta, alpha, mu, beta and higher frequencies above 30 hertz, which are collectively referred to as gamma frequencies. And again, these low frequencies tend to represent what are called thalamocortical modulation, basically how deeper brain structures modulate cortex. Kind of, it's almost like the spotlight that coordinates different areas of brain working together. Cor uh, these gamma rhythms, these higher frequencies, are thought to represent more focal constrained cortical circuits. Now, there's a number of different ways that we look at these, these uh, rhythms. Uh, we look at how they change in their power or amplitude, and that's kind of, a, and we're going to return to this quite a bit. Uh, phase, uh, you know, how do different areas coordinate between each other? Band limited covariance, how do different areas change their power together? And phase power correlation, how does one frequency affect the power of another correlation? Okay? Now, one of the most common ways that we, as far as signals that we use for brain-computer interface control, uh, is uh, changes in amplitude or changes in power. And again, here's kind of amplitude versus frequency, and this is from an EEG signal. And th this right here is the uh, non-active scenario, and this here is the active scenario, where basically somebody's doing an imagined motor movement. And you can use that activation versus rest to, to distinguish kind of two different uh, um, targets. So for instance, you could, if you wanted something to move to the bottom target, you imagine moving your hand, it creates a suppression in the amplitude, kind of what you see here, and that'll move you toward the bottom target. And if you basically don't do that action, you go to rest, that'll go towards the rest, rest state, and that'll move you in a different direction. Let me show you an example of that. 
And so now what you're going to see is here's a, here's a guy with an EEG cap, and he's using an imagined motor movement. <coughs> and when he wants it to go in one direction, he imagines moving his hand. When he wants to go into the other direction, he just basically sits and rests, and he doesn't do anything. And the distinguishing between the active and the rest scenarios can allow him to move a cursor in a very simple direction. Again, very simple control, but it's a demonstration that you can use your brain signals uh, for in a non-invasive way uh, to achieve simple levels of control. Now, again, EEG also has problems. Uh, because these electrodes are on your scalp, they're really susceptible to various forms of noise. Uh, noise, whether it be from your, your body, such as uh, 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 EMG, kind of muscle artifact, or from the external environment, a noisy uh, 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 light bulb, for instance. And so here's an example looking at a raw trace from an EEG, and somebody blinks their eyes, and you can see how much it distorts the signal afterwards. And the problem with that is ultimately that makes the control erratic. Even if it's simple, you want it to be consistent. And, so, and that's been a, a problem with the EEG-derived control systems. And that really brings us to kind of what is, in my opinion, kind of a happy medium in between, uh, and that's electrocorticography. Basically, again, signal acquired from the surface of the brain. And I'm going to talk a lot about ECOG in its context of uh, gamma rhythms, that we have access to these high frequencies, and that gives us some very unique and important information about cognitive processing. And so, again, we're, our goal is, at least from a neurosurgical standpoint, to create a brain-computer interface that'll, that facilitates the control of ex, uh, external elements in the world. And what I've told you about so far is EEG has limited degrees of freedom. Uh, it functions somewhat erratically. And it takes a long time to train to use these signals. So oftentimes, for one-dimensional one, one and two-dimensional control, it can take up to anywhere from weeks to months to achieve some level of functional control. Single unit systems, uh, again, we, we've seen that they can achieve a high level of control. But right now, there's been problems with the durability of the signal. The electrodes will cancel out. And that's where ECOG. Uh, may be the sweet spot for the signal. Uh, the signal is much more robust than EEG, millivolts uh, uh, versus microvolts with EEG. It has much better regional discrimination, meaning that you can get, find uh, independent signals uh, much closer together. And also because you're not penetrating the brain, uh, the electrodes are much less uh, likely to have problems with scarring. And so one thing that I'm definitely going to highlight, in addition to the space and the time, is again this access to frequency. This, these higher frequencies give us a lot of information about cognitive intent, which I'm going to walk you through, both in regards to motor function as well as speech function. So once again, EEG, here's what you see. Uh, basically, kind of low, these low frequencies upwards to around 30 to 40 hertz. And again, we refer to it often at times as a low frequency band. And when cortex becomes active, power decreases. And here you can see it's broadly represented over cortex. When you look at ECOG, we can see much higher frequencies, and it tends to be anatomically constrained. So a much smaller area of cortex becomes active with these high frequencies, and that's important. And I'll show you an example of that in a, more, in a moment. And once again, when cortex becomes active at the high frequencies, the power increases. So it's different from between the low frequency band and the high frequency band. Now, the model that I use to study this, because again, it's not like you can just kind of grab somebody off the street and put electrodes over the surface of their brain. You know, that, that, that might run into human studies violations. So um, the context that we study this in is in patients with intractable epilepsy. Essentially, there's a certain subset of patients who have intractable seizures who require the placement of electrodes placed over the surface of their brain to identify where their seizures are coming from. And they, they usually are monitored for upwards of around a week. And so that once we put their grid in, this is an example of the electrode array that I've implanted here. Here you can see an x-ray with the electrodes over the surface of their brain. That kind of, they're monitored for a week to essentially um, have their seizures, but also do brain mapping. And during that time, it allows us a unique opportunity to test them so that we can have them do various cognitive tasks. We can have them do brain-computer interface experiments while they're essentially waiting to have seizures. And then once they have their seizures, they're, they're then going to go for surgery, get their grid taken out, and have their definitive surgery to remove that seizure focus. Okay, But also, again, as I said, it really gives us unique access to human cortex, but also unique access to human cognitive intentions, because certain things like you know, um, human language really doesn't exist in a, motor, in a monkey model, for instance. So now let's talk about some of these high frequencies and kind of how they're important. So one of the things, when we first started doing a, a BCI experience, once again, we did very similar stuff to uh, EEG. We basically took the raw signal looked at the power versus frequency, and we looked at for changes. But now we looked at the changes in high frequencies. 
Uh, again, because we had access to those. And again, we looked at an active condition versus a rest condition, and we used the, the difference between those two signals uh, to control a cursor in one or two dimensions. Now, the nice thing is, since we were able, since gamma rhythms tend to be much more cortically constrained, meaning that, so for instance, this is an activation here associated with a tongue movement. Here is an activation associated with a hand movement. And again, one thing I want to point out is that regardless of whether you actually do the mo movement or you imagine doing the movement, so this is somebody imagining moving their tongue, this is somebody imagining moving their hand, the signals look very, very similar. So that, and that's important from a BCI standpoint, because you don't want to actually have to do your movement, especially if you're paralyzed, to create the signal to control the device, right? Um, so kind of real and imagined motor physiology are very, very similar. And so now, since we can separate these areas topographically, meaning uh, kind of on where and cortex, we can use those different signals for device control. And let me show you an example of that. So here's one of our subjects. He's, he had surgery several days prior. And uh, again, it's a little bit bright in here, so it's kind of hard to see the cursor moving. Uh, but basically, he's moving a cursor towards the red target. When he hits it, it turns yellow. And this is you know, roughly after around 20 to 30 minutes of training, and he really kind of knocks the lights out. And the interesting thing is when you talk to him, again, he's using, re he's using imagined hand movements and imagined tongue movements to make it go up and down, left and right. And when you ask him after a while, he says, well, what are you doing? And you're like, well, I just wanted to go up and I just wanted to go down. So it's almost kind of like training wheels. You know, that you give them some cognitive task to train on, but then they just kind of figure out how to do it on their own. And uh, again, for both one-dimensional control and two-dimensional control, we, we achieve control really quickly using these high frequencies, really effective control in around the 20 to 30 minutes which for us was very exciting because at the time, EEG, again, for one-dimensional control is taking several weeks. For two-dimensional control is taking about you know, several months to even upwards as long as two years. So 30 minutes is pretty good. Now, he got bored, actually, with um, just doing kind of, you know, controlling a cursor in the two dimensions. So he actually wanted to play some video games. And this is actually a nice example. So what you're going to see here is now he's using actual movements. Remember, it doesn't matter whether you're using actual or imagined. And you're going to see him, uh, he controls... Now, this is actually demonstrating my age, because I, I remember Space Invaders. But um, So he's controlling this little cannon to shoot the, the different Space Invaders, and he controls whether it goes left and right. And you can kind of see it matched up to his hand movements here. Again, we're just decoding the movements from his brain. And as an aside, he, he has the Guinness Book of World Records highest score achieved on a video game using his brain. There's not that many people that have played, so it was pretty easy to get. But uh, um, So anyway... So, but again, it doesn't matter whether you're actually doing it or imagining doing it. And here's an example where uh, he's now using imagined hand movements, uh, playing the video game. And he got roughly about the same score. Now again, once you have a control feature, kind of what do you want to control? It becomes an app, right? Whether it's a cursor on a screen, playing Space Invaders, or as, just to show you another example here, here's one of our subjects controlling a, a robotic arm. You can see kind of, you know, it opens and closes when he, uh, the robotic hand opens and closes when he uh, opens and closes his hand. And so we did this in a little kid. He thought this was the most fun. It was, he had just watched the movie Terminator, so he loved it. So, but one of the things I've shown you is kind of our early stages was using activation versus rest, right? Uh, an activation a task versus a rest task to get control. And one of the things that we became very interested in is, can we go beyond just cortical activation? Can we start to get at true motor intentions? And so this is an example here, and we're looking at the data from a single electrode over a motor region. And if you remember the monkey test, the center out task, well, now what our monkeys, or not our monkey, our patient is doing here is they're doing a similar task uh, to the monkey using a joystick. They're moving a cursor from the center of the screen to a peripheral target on the screen. And what we see here is what's called a time frequency plot, frequency here, time here. And the color you see is an increase or decrease in amplitude. Red is an increase, blue is a decrease. And uh, when he, in this example, when he moves to the left, we see an increase in amplitude in this particular location, roughly between 70 and 160 hertz, whereas when he moves to the left, it goes down. So we were able to distinguish whether we wanted to move left or whether we wanted to move right from the single electrode. Okay? And when we put a number of different electrodes together, we could actually start to see very similar tuning curves kind of from what you saw with the single unit system. So on the micro, on, on the single neuron level as well as in the large cortical population level, we could start to see tuning to given directions 
based on different cortical populations. And now I'm going to show you an example of that. And so here's, this is kind of a busy kind of little slide movie here, but uh, this is kind of, you're going to see cortical changes associated with horizontal movement and cortical changes associated with vertical movement. Again, this is basically changes from the same brain, but we split them up to make it a little bit easier to interpret. And what you're going to see appear here is the actual movement in black of the person moving a, a cursor around with the joystick and the predicted movement in green. And what you see is that it's, it's certainly not perfect, but it's pretty good in that we can actually predict kind of where that person wants to move their cursor based on their brain signals alone from these larger cortical populations. So using these larger cortical populations, we can infer intentions uh, from the brain surface. So in kind of some more recent studies, is not only can we do kind of you know, proximal arm movements, like you're moving a joystick, but actually people have recently just shown that you can also uh, individually um, separate out individual finger movements. And this has been uh, demonstrated in a couple of different studies now. So we can, we can now know whether you move, where, what direction you want to move and which fingers you want to move using ECOG signals. So again, the nice thing about our model is we can start to do stuff that the monkeys can't do, such as speech. And so we're starting to look at uh, um, uh, kind of what is some of the cortical physiology associated with the different components of speech. Because what I've shown you so far is kind of this continuous style movement, moving a cursor around in space. And one of the things that we're very interested in is kind of just, well, we don't write a paper using our, our mouse, right? We have, we have different abilities to select things. We have choices, and that's our keyboard. And so we thought that speech might be a unique uh, uh, phys or physiologic substrate to give us additional control features for discrete selection. And so if we can just get one phoneme, for instance, or one component of speech out reliably, that could give us a click function. If we can do multiple um, uh, phonemes or different components of speech, that could potentially give us multiple choices, a right and left click, for instance. And if we got really good and we can dis discriminate multiple different phonemes, perhaps we could even create a cortically-based language where somebody could directly communicate with a computer using their imagined speech alone. And so, again, I'm going to show you an example here. Again, we're returning to our time frequency plot, frequency on the y-axis, time on the uh, x-axis here. Again, this is the, the grid position on one of our patients. And what you're going to see here is us comparing the cortical activations between different phonemic classes of words. We had them say words like that had e, u, a, and e type of words in them. So bead, bed, booed, bad, something like that. And so an e versus u here produces a specific frequency band change in this particular electrode here. That wasn't there when they said a versus a. Again, a different frequency change here in this particular location. A versus u, again, a different frequency change. E versus a, again, a different frequency change. And we can now use those different signal changes between these different phonemic classes of words that can allow us, once again, to uh, perform some device control. And here I'm going to show you an example of one of our subjects. Again, in this particular example, she's using around 75 to 105 hertz. And she's using imagined, uh, she's imagining ah or imagining ooh to control whether the cursor goes left or right. Okay, and so now, and when you ask her what she's doing, she's saying ah, 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 to move it to the left, ooh, 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 to move it to the right. And again, this is without any training. Her performance essentially was kind of between, I think, 97 and 100% uh, right off the bat. So we can use speech. I think this is our one mistake here. Kind of include that for honesty's sake. So that speech does become a viable option. Now the interesting thing is that when we looked at that, it was a single electrode where we used a, a single frequency band to distinguish between ah and u in that very specific example. But the interesting thing is that these different frequencies really can give us a lot of different information about what they're doing. And so now I'm going to show you another example of that. Again, this is kind of a busy slide. This is what's called a, a kind of a log plot of the power. Um, but basically, so this is all data taken from a single electrode, uh, kind of over uh, kind of a speech area here. And what we see is that when they were hearing a, a, sp a specific word, that we saw an increase in the frequency band at around 100 hertz, which wasn't there when they were reading the same word. When they were preparing to say that word after an auditory cue, uh, we saw a broader frequency band here but quite a different response when they were preparing to say the same word after reading it first. Again, down at 100 hertz and up at roughly 250 hertz. And then when they spoke the word, we see this broadband change uh, here 
but it's quite different. Again, they're speaking the same word, but they have different frequency changes um, between whether they heard it or whether they saw it. So we can infer a lot of information about kind of, kind of what's going on from a very small location. So these electrodes uh, measure 2.3 millimeters in diameter. So we can get a lot of information just by looking at the different frequencies. So then the question is, how small can we go? You know, and so we started to implant, uh, in addition to our classic clinical arrays, we started putting microgrids in. And so again, here's just an example. We put a microgrid over motor cortex. Again, here's its size relative to a penny right there. And there were 16 electrodes, and they're spaced one millimeter apart. And we measured the EMG, or kind of the motor signals from their arms as they would flex and extend their wrist. And so kind of what they would do is, again, here's kind of the grid, here's the setup, and they would see a screen that they, you know, move your right hand, they would flex and extend their right hand. Uh, move your left hand, they'd flex and extend their left hand. And we wanted to look at this, how, how these frequencies change relative to these uh, distinct movements. And what we found was that contralateral, meaning the, uh, the arm opposite, on the opposite side of where the microelectrode array was, had a specific pattern for flexion and extension, which was quite different from ipsilateral for flexion and extension. So from this little four millimeter by four millimeter area, we could figure out whether you're flexing and extending both arms, or excuse me, both wrists. So that's a lot of information out of a small area of cortex. And we also did that for, in a different patient, and this is an example of a, microarray, a microarray that we implanted over speech. And again, we wanted to distinguish ah versus ooh. And again, a, these, are, these electrodes are about 70 microns, uh, spaced one millimeter apart, and we see very focal changes at around 400 hertz that help us distinguish whether the person was saying ah versus ooh. Now let me show you an example of her using these signals for control. I don't know if you can hear that. So again, we can achieve this control from a very small area of cortex. I think this is a. Oh, well, should I go back to that? Okay. Uh, yeah. Did you actually do the simulation to find where to put that four millimeter array? No. Mm -mm. No, we uh, um, we basically placed it on uh, ana anatomic coordinates. Uh, basically, but part of the problem is you know when when I'm putting these grids in the the the, the uh, patients are under anesthesia, so I can't use stimulation to find out where their speech area is. So we did under, under anatomic uh, stereotactic coordinates. So uh, actually, let me go back here for a moment. So now the question is, okay, uh, we can use a small area of cortex. Now how invasive do we need to be? Because, and I'm going to return kind of to a brief anatomy lesson here. Is again, we have our scalp here where we get our EEG. We have the skull, and then we have that membrane that I talked about, the dura. Can we put the electrodes above or below the dura? Having it above the dura, there are some advantages. Because again, the dura is, again, it's this leathery membrane that really is kind of our last barrier uh, for, from the outside world. So that if we could put these sub, or excuse me, epidurally, that that would be a, a much less invasive case than if we put them subdurally. Neither is incompatible with a, a clinical approach, but epidurally certainly would be, uh, that would be an outpatient procedure, for instance. And so, uh, what we did is we have we had specialized arrays where we would put one above and below the dura over the same gyrus, and this is kind of an example here. Here you see the uh, array, and we would basically look at the uh, uh, the baseline brain signals to see how different they were. Uh, and basically, what we looked at was the magnitude of the signal as well as the correlation between the electrodes. We want the magnitude of sig the the magnitude of signal to be high, and we want the correlation to be low. And so here what we're seeing is, again, here's the uh, voltage of the signal. We have a here's our subdural electrodes, our epidural electrodes. These are the microelectrodes, and then the macroelectrodes. These are the other 64 electrodes in terms of the signal, signal size. And what we see is, again, subdural, and when we first saw this, you know, it looks like it's a little bit better. It has a higher signal than the epidural. But both are about in the same range as the macroelectrode in, the, in terms of the absolute size of the signal. Now, but it gets a little bit more interesting in that when we looked at... Uh, uh, kind of low frequencies versus high frequencies. Once again, low frequencies tended to have an improved uh, uh, voltage compared to epidural signals here, but again, in about the same range. But once we got to the high frequencies, they were roughly about the same. So that that was encouraging because again, if high frequencies are kind of where the money are, then that it, we could we could in terms of the signal size uh, potentially use these epidural signals. 
We also looked at correlation. And again, kind of a similar trend in that the low frequencies seem to have a higher level of correlation here. But once we got down to the um, uh, uh, higher frequencies, that the correlation was much similar. Subdural is still a little bit better than epidural, but they were much closer here in terms of uh, 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 decorrelating as we got up there. So that, that again, th those results are still, I'd say, somewhat preliminary, so I think we have to do more of that. But if it was epidural, we can imagine relatively easy, straightforward surgery. Uh, yeah? Can you talk about how this limits to superficial to I'm sorry, I didn't hear that question. Uh, it's a, in general, we would be looking for either, whether it's subdural or epidural, we'd be looking at the crown of the gyrus, not the sulcus, for instance. Uh, that, and that's true for all um, uh, ECOG signals. And in part because, and let me see if I can show you an example here. In general, the sulcus, is this what you're talking about, kind of the deep portion? You, the, the, there's an, actually another membrane, which I kind of didn't talk about here, but there's a, a thin membrane that really kind of glosses over here. So you really never get electrodes into this deep sulcus right here, into those valleys. In general, you're looking at the, the crown of the gyrus for any ECOG signal. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I guess I'm, what I'm really asking is, what do you think the distance is you're measuring for? For the microgrids? For one for, uh, well, for a microgrid, you're probably looking at around one uh, kind of two, uh, uh, one to two millimeters worth of cortical signal. Uh, for the macro grid, you're probably looking at a little bit, th the size of that electrode is around 2.3 millimeters. So you're probably looking at something a little bit bigger than that, um, around three or four millimeters worth of cortical change. Does that get at your question? Okay. So let's kind of go forward here for a sec. Let's see how we're doing for time, good. And so, again, I'm actually going to walk you through a virtual procedure of what this would potentially look like. So, um, again, with the, when we're putting the grids in, that's a big surgery. Uh, excuse me. We're taking a big window of bone off. Uh, we're putting a large grid array. But, again, if we're using microgrids, we can imagine what's called a burr hole. And, again, I, I basically doctored up uh, some pictures of a, a procedure where I made a burr hole for a different reason. But, anyway, we're making a linear incision here. And that takes around three minutes to shave. We're, we're doing what's preparing. Uh, the area for surgery, uh, where we drape it up. That takes several minutes. Then we make the incision. Again, that takes about five minutes to cut. There's the surface of the bone there. Uh, we use a drill, drill a hole, and that's the dura down there. At that point, we would kind of screw in our uh, implant, which would be kind of like putting, screwing in a thimble into that hole. And then we would close up, and that would take about 10 minutes. So the surgery would take probably around 30 to 45 minutes to uh, implant a brain-computer interface. So what I think we can expect from a near future standpoint is, again, if we can get, I think we can reliably get two-dimensional control, and with the utilization of speech, certainly we can get a click function. So and the question is, well, what kind of functionality can you get out of two-dimensional controls with a click? Well, I'll show you an example of two-dimensional control with a click. It's, a, it's an iPhone or an iPad, basically kind of moving around in uh, XY space and then tapping. So really it becomes what, what kind of app do you want? And so I think for, the, for people with severe motor disabilities, whether they be quadriplegic patients, patients with ALS, that uh, you can imagine uh, simple communication devices, controlling a Windows operating system, which can potentially substantially facilitate their lives. Now, but I really do think that is just the beginning, and that I think we're really starting to see a, a lot of changes, and they're happening rapidly. And I think that it's kind of the, what I call the tip of the iceberg of something kind of more substantial, this idea that we can decode information from the brain, and that that has larger and more substantive in implications. And this idea, and I kind of draw an analogy to mapping out the human genome. It's, an, it's a problem of information, and it's a problem of scale. But similar to the genome, just as basically all biologic diversity is governed by four nucleotides, that there are some simple rules that govern uh, how information is encoded into cortex. And we're just starting to learn those rules. I certainly don't know that, I don't even think we know all four nucleotides of brain signals, but we're starting to learn that they, they exist, and we're starting, to, we're starting to decode that information. And I think the implications are just as big. And I think that uh, kind of similar to kind of, you know, previous uh, kind of, grand projects in science, whether it be lunar exploration, which led to kind of computers, internet, jet propulsion, uh, and modern materials, 
kind of like we see with the human genome today, that we really start to see an unfolding of a lot of different things happening, whether it be novel uh, molecular uh, uh, therapeutics and diagnostics uh, for cancer and infections, biotechnology, bioinformatics, individual risk assessment, and uh, personalized medical treatments. I think we're going to see similar grand changes occur uh, with decoding a, uh, of neural information that you can see, you can imagine uh, seamless human-machine interactions, more efficient person-to-person -person communication, uh, treatment and understanding of uh, uh, a number of different psych uh, psychiatric and neurologic disorders, and fundamentally, if you can understand how the brain processes information, that you can also artificially uh, recreate it. And I, I, let me finish kind of with a quote from a, a newspaper from 1972. Base, seven quarters later, they were having extended uh, volleys, and the constant pong noise was attracted. It was attracting the curiosity of others at the bar. Before closing, everybody in the bar had played the game. The next day, people were lined up outside Andy Capps at 10 a.m. to play pong. Around 10 o'clock that night, the game suddenly died. The machine coin container was full. So people were lining up out of out of a bar to play pong in 1972. And these kind of you know 30 years later. We have video games like this, which basically we take for granted. We don't even, I don't want, this is certainly not going to have anybody lining up outside of a bar for. It's just a part of our lives. And I would argue, kind of, here we are again in 2006 where people get excited about playing a video game with your brain. And I think that we're going to see an equal level of dramatic change over the next several decades uh, that are going to uh, uh, alter the way we interact with machines. So again, thank you very much uh, for taking the time uh, to listen to me talk, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Now, we've, we've set up a microphone uh, in between the seats. OK, two questions. First, have you measured bit rates that you can actually get? It's a great question. So uh, right now, the highest bit rate uh, of any uh, human BCI is around 50 bits per minute. So it's, it's 50 bits per minute. Yeah, it's pretty slow. So yeah. if you think away from like uh, people who have severe disabilities, but people like like you and me, I, right. I have some too, but you might not. Um, uh, I think we all. There seems some. to be this trade-off between uh, invasiveness versus bit rates. Uh, to some and degree, there that's, seems that's, to be that's a correct. barrier. We we won't be. That I question whether we can actually really surpass it. Which is, if you stay non-invasive, there might be a maximum bit rate we might be able to get, and that's it. And then you have to get closer and closer to the brain to the point that at some point you have to maybe plaster the brain with electrodes. Which think, people might not be willing to accept. Um, now, that certainly may be true. For um, video games, you didn't have to, to, to break our skull and, and, and get into it. You just I, I, made I, I guess it, become, it becomes a, a, a cultural question, to be quite frank. So for instance, if you could have a bit rate equivalent of, say, moving a mouse and a joy, or a joystick, um, which is today is around uh, 300 bits per minute, if I remember correctly, for uh, um, a mouse. Would people be willing to undergo a surgical procedure, uh, which, quite frankly, is uh, less invasive and less risky than s current surgical procedures, whether it be a deep brain stimulator for the treatment of a tremor, or less risky uh, from a, than a breast augment? And so you could take a poll and say, OK, who would rather go to Fry's and get a joystick and do the same thing, or who would undergo surgical procedures? Well, but let, let, me finish, yeah, well, let me finish my art. <laughs> let me finish my pitch. So again. If you have uh, kind of, if you could say get 300 bits of control uh, with a, uh, a small implant the size of a thimble, um, kind of would you know would that could allow you to control your environment? That could allow you know because it's not just simply controlling. It, just like moving a mouse is not just moving a mouse. It facilitates your control of all sorts of technologies. Um, you can imagine controlling your environment. You can imagine controlling all sorts of things. And again, 30 years ago, uh, kind of you know the reason people got breast augments was not for uh, cosmetic reasons, it was for the purposes of mastectomies. So culture has changed that has allowed people to uh, adopt those type of technologies. And I, you can almost think of this as kind of the augment, you know, for the information age. So, do we want to do a poll? I'd be happy to. <laughs> okay. Well, not yet. So it's. A, That's, yeah, it's not a fair question. Let's, okay, let's add to that that you're disabled and can't use your hands. Then it becomes a, a yeah, with this, this, his question is, is he's talking about augment. You know, would people do it for an augment reason? It means hey. you can do texting and driving at the same time. <laughs> okay, this is the question. Texting and driving.
could type in the same time safely, but people really think it rains. You could text at any moment in time. I see Astro raising his hand. Consider it. Okay, so one? Yeah, maybe. Okay. Okay, fair enough. You know. Yeah. So, um, if you're if you're implanting and then covering up, uh, what are the what are the ways that you're looking at to do that communication through the through the skull through the skin, um, and what do you see on the horizon as uh, better techniques? So, for instance, so I, I think your question is, what would I see the implant looking like in terms of its kind of nuts and bolts, like the. Yeah. I guess I assume you're not going to, you know, have an actual wire sticking out of people's Absolutely. heads. Absolutely, no, that's right. So, so, so yeah, what they, are the... one would imagine uh, again, it's going to be a microelectrode array uh, with an integrated uh, chip that'll have the amplification capacity uh, and uh, uh, wireless power and transmission capability, all in in that uh, uh, kind of thimble-sized uh, uh, um, format that can fit within the hole of a skull. So basically, what you would see, kind of what I showed you in that little clip, that would be the entirety of the device. And that the scalp would close over. And that would you, the, how would you get power to it exactly? Well, it would ha it would have battery power that would be kind of inductively powered probably in the evenings. So, for instance, like you know they they, 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 or they basically it's in their pillow and it wirelessly powers it you know while they sleep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, a couple of questions and a comment. Uh, first one, uh, you seem to imply by some of the things you were saying that for people that have neurological disorders like can't control their extremities that the brain is okay and the problem is in the nerves that connect the brain to, um, say, the hand. That's right. Therefore, if you could pick up the intents, then the, the brain's perfectly fine. That's and, exactly and right. We, okay. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. Okay. That's exactly right. Uh, second thing is uh, all of the sensor techniques that you described were, um, uh, were voltage sensors. Mm -hmm. And I imagine that the current is so low in the brain that uh, field effect pickups probably uh, couldn't work. Is that true, or is uh, there any, or is because that, you know, that just has a, a, a totally different approach to getting the information out. Uh, I'm not sure I understood your question. So basically, the, the uh, voltage um, is it's on the order of millivolts. Well, if there is a voltage change, there uh -huh. must have been a current change. That's right. And anytime there's a current, simply where there's an associated B field, a magnetic field, right, and you right. can pick that up. If you're close enough or sensitive enough, you know, like say, uh, are you talking uh, about like magnetic? Yeah, 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 right. know, like a non-invasive magnetic signature. Correct, uh, right? I, but I'm guessing uh, that the reason we it's, it's use on the order of femtotesla. It's quite small, and it's incredible because people certainly do use MEG yeah. to look at some of these uh, uh, type of signals. Uh, the signals are quite small, and you have to be in an isolated room. So if you were yeah. in a normal <clears throat> environment, you probably couldn't use magnetic. Yeah, that's fields. what I thought. Yeah, and because of that. Uh, I think it's probably also true that the brain and voltage sensors stuck in the brain are probably um, fairly immune to EMI interference. In other words, other fields. In other words, there's not that much of a field there. It's operating on these uh, chemically generated voltage swings, and mm -hmm. therefore um, uh, the light bulb interference that you talked about is affecting the sensor but not affecting the brain. That's correct. That's correct. Yeah, okay. absolutely. And if something like this were to become uh, commercially, you know, available, you go down to Fry's and buy your implant at 300 bits a minute. Since I'm a drummer, I could become an octopus of a drummer and just do all kinds of things that more than I could do with just two hands. So I'm all for it. I. Okay. I, well, I <laughs> all right. Well, first let's 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 help the spinal cord injury patients. Let's help the let's help right. the stroke patients, and, right. and you're next. <laughs> Uh, my question is about the scaling of the recording of the, the electrode techniques. So uh, 30 years ago, people would record from a few electrodes. Uh, and I wonder, how, what's the doubling time? How many years more it would take us to have double the number of channels, et cetera? That is a good question. Because um, right now, we can certainly, within, I think in our current form factor, we could get 16 to 32 channels within kind of what we're talking about. Um, the the honest answer is, you know, again, my background tends to be more physiologic and, and, and neurosurgical. I'm not sure I can answer the question uh, in terms of kind of the rate of change of amplifiers and sensor technologies and how, how compact can you get it. In general, I think since 
most of the stuff moves pretty quickly. Kind of certainly, kind of our amplifiers, even from five years ago, have changed dramatically. Uh, so, I think that you probably could get uh, increased number of channels in there. How many and at what time? It's harder for me to answer. So, so what's the past short history? How, what was the doubling time until now? Say it again. Uh, when was the so we? At some point, we doubled the number of electrodes. If we look back, how many years did it take us to double to get to this point? Uh, so, well, I, I, it, the single unit experience is the longest, and that's around 30 years. And they've gone from single neurons recording even back in the 80s. They were monitoring up, you know, up to 10 to 30. Now they can do, um, they can certainly do 60 to 100. The issue is, you know, how many electrodes do you need? You know, and so uh, right now it looks like 60 from a, a, a mic, kind of a single unit electrode is enough. Uh, 16 to 32, maybe 100 would be great uh, for, from that. So I think, you know, from electrode sensors, we're pretty good. It's just more creating the implant, an integrated implant. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Hey. Hey. So um, um, this question is about the cognitive load. So um, those patients are thinking really hard about ahs or oohs to do this. Um, and of course, we'd like them to not think so hard about it and still have the response and be able to drive and eat sandwich that, and text that, all at the same that, time. Have you question. guys yeah, looked yeah. into that cognitive load yeah, issue? Yeah, and, and the, the honest answer is I think that that's something that we still are working on testing. Right now, we're just showing that we can get the level of control that we want to. But can cognitive load uh, prohibit or get in the way? I think, I think we still have to test it out. Um, okay. Do you feel that the modality EEG, ECOG, and then the, you know, the in, in single electrodes, do you think if you became more invasive, you would overcome that easier, or you don't believe the limitation comes from that? I, I'm guessing, but I think that's likely, only because, for instance, with EEG, you have to engage a broader area of cortex uh, to get the signal that you need. So if you're using a broader area of cortex, chances are that if you have other stimuli or if you're tending to different things, it's going to disrupt that larger swath of cortex. So my question is related to his octopus drummer uh, uh -huh. uh, scenario. Um, that, how likely would it be for us to be able to control forearms? <laughs> this, is, this actually gets back to a question uh, Astro and I were talking about earlier. How many independent degrees of freedom can you achieve? So, for instance, if I, it, we could, and, and, and to give Astro credit, he was like, well, what if I, you know, created this kind of totally artificial thing that I manipulated with my hands? Or, or as an analogy, what if I gave you just two robotic arms? Could you learn to control them uh, in addition to your two arms? I think the psychophysics of that still needs to be tested. I don't know the answer. So, so far you have been talking about being able to detect uh, signals from brain, uh -huh. and you mentioned at the very beginning the you know you could have also feedback in the opposite direction. And I'm just curious if people right now are doing anything and what would be like they the are. outlook they, to the future. Yeah, they are. There, there's several um, sensory brain computer interfaces that people are working on. Um, kind of closest to the motor field is kind of sensory feedback, so that you stimulate the sensory cortex. Uh, so that not only do you say, for instance, control a robotic arm, but that the robotic arm gives you feedback to your brain so that you can feel what you're touching. Alternatively, people are also working on visual prosthetics, stimulating occipital cortex or visual cortex to create artificial visual perceptions. It's still, um, again, uh, relatively simple in that basically when you stimulate um, uh, visual cortex, you get what are called phosphenes, basically kind of pixelated bright dots, no formed images yet, but enough pixelated dots so that people can, for instance, a blind person can potentially navigate a room. Looks like that's it. Uh, thank you, Eric. Yep. Thank talk. you very much, everybody. Thanks thank for coming. Thank you all for coming out.